Hi, welcome to A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God by Karen Armstrong. I'm Christy Winters. And today what we're going to be doing is just what I said we'd do in the last video. I will present Karen Armstrong's worldview. In the next video I will then present a counter. And I'm also going to present a series of attributes, a sort of a concept of God in the third video that we can use as we move into the book. Now I will also just do a bit of housekeeping. It looks like each of these videos are going to run to about 10 minutes in length, maybe a little bit more, but certainly not past 11 because that's all the memory that my card will hold at about four gigs. So uh, until my next paycheck, we're stuck at 10 minute videos. But I think that'll be fine. It's a good bite-sized piece of information. I'll also put all of these on a playlist so that you can just follow along to the next one automatically without having to search for it or anything. So now that we've got all of that started, let's talk a little bit about Karen Armstrong's worldview. The reason I want to do this is because in order to have a really interesting discussion, we need to be accurate. Uh, in terms of what Karen is saying so that we're not misrepresenting her views and setting up straw men. And she's got a very unique kind of perso uh, personal worldview when it comes to theology. And if you watch the Case for God speech or the Big Think interview, I think you'll see that. But to help people who don't have a lot of time, let's just summarize. First thing about Karen Armstrong's theological perspective is that we can take all the sort of structures of Christianity and Judaism and Islam and just chuck them out. I don't think she finds those particularly helpful and so she doesn't really seem to draw on them very much. Instead, she's got a very, as I said, I think kind of unique worldview and that is that Armstrong would assert that there is a reality of God that exists and it's ineffable. It's not something that we can describe with words, it's not something we can abstract about, it's not something we can concretize in a way that's meaningful. I think she would call, and I think she does, that the reality we call God exceeds all human expression. So Armstrong really rejects the idea that God can somehow be conceptualized and abstracted in that, I would say, if you try to give a whole list of attributes of God, you know, omniscience, om, omnibe, omniscience, omnibenevolence, um, all these kinds of omnis, that she would a bit would resist those, not because she doesn't think that they necessarily describe the reality of God, but because they tend to put God in a bit of a conceptual linguistic box. And I think she would argue that God is beyond that. It's it's beyond human expression and human comprehension. So. She rejects this idea and instead focuses less on the orthodoxy of what you believe. In other words, she's less concerned with what you believe and the correctness and how close you are to uh, an orthodox position or a religious sort of prescription of, of rules than for you to have an efficacious spiritual experience. And by that, what she, I think she means is that whatever your interaction with the reality of God is, if that produces an authentic spiritual experience that makes you feel more connected, that belief, that or that activity, shall we say, that interaction is to her far more important than being right or wrong on doctrine. And therefore, as a consequence, you can't really search in for Armstrong's God without f looking at human beings and looking at human experience rather than what people write about in books in terms of doctrine. And we can see her saying this uh, in, in this quote, and I should also mention I'm using the Kindle version of uh, History of God, so all of my page numbers and, and other references will be based on the Kindle edition. So Armstrong says, we shall see that it is far more important for a particular idea of God to work than for it to be logically or scientifically sound. As soon as it ceases to be effective, it will be changed. So for her, God is not a fixed point that human beings kind of come back to and each independently verify this nature of God. Rather, um, God is what is effective for people at that particular time. So we have to investigate human understanding and human expression, and really for the sake of the history of God, and Car I know Karen Armstrong would agree with this, we're really talking about God's inter interactions with men. Because the authors were men, they were writing for a male audience about male concerns, and so this is a one form of this expression, this interaction that she wants to look at. And another quote that I'm going to pull out here to illustrate her perspective on this is, whatever conclusions we reach about the reality of God, 
the history of this idea must tell us something important about the human mind and the nature of our aspiration. So really, I, I think the point that I want to make, just to sum this up very nicely, is that for Armstrong, God is not an object, it's, it's an experience. It's a reality that you interact with uh, rather than a belief that you hold. And the other two things that I really want to highlight and in order to draw uh, both distinctions and a clarification between Karen's theological worldview and perhaps what we would term traditional religious beliefs is uh, that it comes from the Big Think interview that I've linked in the description that in the first section of it where she's discussing important religious ideas and she mentions two that I think provide a pretty good insight as we move forward in the book. The one was a discussion about her interactions with Jewish rabbis and their perspective on God as an iterative ongoing process and I'll just quote from her at minute um, sorry at second 40 in, in that big think interview and this is her quoting from the inspiration of, of Jewish rabbis there is never a last word on God even God can be questioned and you can keep arguing with one another and there will be no end to this conversation about the divine because no human expression of God can be ultimate and I know that this is something that rings true from for Karen Armstrong because of how passionately she spoke about it uh, when she was doing that interview. And I want to combine that comment with another one she makes closer to the end of the segment where she's talking about the pluralism that she found in the Sufi tradition of Islam and the tolerance of different people's religious experiences um, and that again experience being the focus of authenticity rather than focusing on the correctness of beliefs. She quotes from Ibn Arabi, a 12th slash 13th century Sufi mystic who said, do not praise your own faith exclusively so that you disbelieve all the rest. If you do this, you will miss, miss much good. Nay, you will miss the whole truth of the matter. God, the omniscient, the omnipresent, cannot be confined to any one creed. For he says in the Quran, wheresoever ye turn, there is the face of Allah. So Karen, I think, combines this sort of iterative, ongoing, falling forward almost dynamic experience of God as a reality that she found in the Jewish tradition and a, a radical plurality of acceptance in terms of religious experience that she finds in the Sufi tradition. And I think if we have a better understanding that this is the perspective she's coming from, the book will make a lot more sense. So one last thing that I want to pull out about Armstrong's worldview that she seems to assume as part of her book and, and write about is because she has this very open and wide experience or no uh, value is the bright, bright word of tolerance for other people's religious viewpoints then she also generalizes the search for the divine the human quest of the divine as there's a unanimity and i think she would ground her calls for the validity of other people's religious experiences through an appeal that we're all searching for God. And if we're all sincerely searching, we all sincerely find something, then we should sincerely accept somebody else's experience of reality, their experience of the reality of God as an honest expression. So this is a, it's a bit of a essentialist claim uh, in terms that she's asserting that this, this quest is essential to our human nature, but I'll pick up on that in the next video. So I think with that being said, um, I, that is what I'm going to work with in terms of my worldview for Karen as when she says something in the book, I'm going to come back to these points to try to interpret or expand on it or explain it. Um, and if you have any comments or, or questions about uh, Karen's theology um, or if you want to post up some more information, that's great. I do want to say, I don't want to become an expert on, on Karen Armstrong. My intention here was more to um, really give a, a sincere and an honest and charitable presentation of her theology so that it makes for um, a, a more honest but also a more interesting debate as we move forward. So, hey, that's the 10 minute mark. Fantastic, we're running right on time. So I will end this by saying thank you for stopping by and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks.